okay, we were really psyched. We came to Texas Rock Fest. It was not 5,000 people. It was 42 people. <laughs> That's classic yeah. music festival overhype right there. Yep. <laughs> Did they try to make you pre-sell tickets in Norway for it? <laughs> so... Welcome to another episode of Growing Up Christian. I'm Sam. And I'm Casey. And Casey is looking really sweaty today. (laughs) It's so hot here. I mean, I think it's hot everywhere right now, but oh man, it's like, it's too much. Like I would rather have it really hot than deal with like a super cold winter, but still it was like 100 degrees today and humid and had to go jump in the creek for a bit. 100 degrees and humid is a nightmare. I I think it was like 72 and sunny and dry here today, so I was like feeling fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's about perfect. That's what I would... I think if I had my way, it would be like 60 degrees and a light breeze at all times. Yeah, we should do weather updates at the top of every episode. Just, you know... Because people love it when you talk about the weather. It's like it is fun. a good default when you meet somebody or, you know, you have to like, you're waiting to use the microwave at work and someone's just standing there. And you're like, yeah, it's, it's a nice day out, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like every annoying person. <laughs> every annoying person has to tell you about the weather for some reason. <laughs> uh, so you get a, you said you get a swim, what do you? jumped in the lake what do you got near your house what do you well, so we got a we have a creek that runs through our uh our property it's called rock creek and oh, it it's has a pretty name? it's not just like yeah. a dirty nasty thing that you jump in no take yourself in rock like creek and it flows into the walnut river and it's full of all manner of creatures so it's turtles and fish and we saw a gar the other day i don't like a long know what a gar, gar is it's like a it, it's basically like a torpedo with a long skinny snout full of teeth. So it's like your penis. Yeah. It's exactly. just like your penis. <laughs> so you know, appealing and, and welcoming. <laughs> a little slimier. I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but there's Dude, like I- a deep spot in one section. Well, there's a few deep spots, but there's one in particular that like uh my dogs love to swim. So we just like have some inner tubes that we pump up. And when it's this time of year, we'll go out there and just like hang out in the creek for a while at night just to cool off because it's I think it's spring fed at that spot. So it's it's usually like pretty chilly in the water. Yeah, it's a nice contrast. That would scare me. There's too many things, dude. That's not like a public area where like animals, like creatures know like, oh, like uh, if you go to like a pond or a lake that people actually that has a beach that people swim at, it's like, you know, things like snapping turtles. No, like that's not a cool place to hang out. So you don't really have to worry about that shit. But just jumping into a lake in your backyard, basically like a cr- creek, as you call it. <laughs> it's like- I feel like I grew up swimming in creeks and lakes <laughs> and stuff like that. There is an element of like, ugh. like uh, my buddy Jesse, we would we would go up to the lake house every summer with his grandparents, and he was like very squeamish about touching the the bottom because yeah. it oh, was mushy. It's awful. Yeah, so he would like try to tread water in like three feet of water, <laughs> and <laughs> my uh, my hold wife's your nose cousin. and stuff your feet in. Yeah, seriously. My wife's cousins lived in a like had like lived on a lake for a minute, and I that that was probably the last time I swam in a lake. Uh, but like I just remember touching the bottom, and you feel that mush like squish between your toes. I always am afraid there's like a snapping turtle there. It's like terrifying to me. I'm afraid of snapping turtles ever since I was told like they'll literally like bite your toes off when I was a I kid. I think they can. Yeah, they really probably can. It's dude. That reminds me when I was in um so I went to I I mentioned it before. I maybe when we I don't know, we talked about guns at one point. Like the last time I shot guns was when I was in high school and we went to Montana. 
uh, cause I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned like shooting him into like a mountain range or whatever in the middle of absolute nowhere. So we had a family friend out in Montana and we went and we, I don't remember where it was some big name river that goes through it. My geography's trash. So I'm not going to sit here and just guess rivers until I come up with the right one. But I was in, you know, high school, we've been over what I was in high school, you know, struggling to find an identity, trying to find like stuff that would make me stand out i don't know like I, yeah, when i was there plug in. yeah i pretty when i was there i definitely bought like a cowboy hat and was like i'm gonna wear this this will be my th- i'll be the cowboy hat guy tried that out for a week before i felt like an absolute fucking idiot and then retired that bad boy but we had um <laughs> we it was like this whatever river was going through it i was like i'm gonna i'll swim across the river it's not wide not a wide river but definitely like when you're not a strong swimmer and you're like gauging the distance it, it's always it's farther always, than yeah. you think mm-hmm. so i'm like i can swim through that and then i'll be like oh i swam across such and such a river halfway across the river the people who we were staying with one of the one of them yells out something about watch out for snakes. And I just like shit my pants in the middle of the river. I was like, fuck, I didn't even think about snakes. <laughs> like I'm from <laughs> Massachusetts. Snakes. There's nothing poisonous, dangerous, life threatening in Massachusetts. Maybe like, like I don't, we have nothing. We, I mean, a ba- we have bears, but you don't just like happen upon those. So like is I didn't cross my mind that something horrible could happen to me in the middle of a river. So I get across the river and like when there's like probably 10 feet, I'm like so tired too. Like it was a nightmare. I really underestimated my athletic ability on that one. And I'm like near the end of it. And it's all just thick weeds and shit. Like you can barely swim through it. I'm terrified to touch the ground. I probably could have at that point. So I'm like, I (laughs) swim until my fingers touch dirt on the other side and I'm like hyperventilating. I'm like, there's absolutely a snake in here. Like I'm going to get my ass bit and I'm going to just uh, poison. I'm going to get poison injected into me. And I'm on the other side of a fucking river. And this is where it ends. Like I hit a full existential crisis at that point like (laughs) dread set in make it across and then it's like oh watch like rat watch out for rattlers like they just hang out in the rocks like why are there fucking snakes everywhere like all there's just there isn't a place where snakes don't hang out in montana i guess so i mean to be fair did you see one no i didn't but i was scared (laughs) i did not and uh anyway luckily when i swam back there's a guy who was kayaking at the time and he just saw me basically fighting for my life to get across the river and just floated there, like stayed in the general area until I made it across. So he didn't have to like watch a child drown. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not a strong swimmer, so I don't, I don't uh, put myself in those situations much, but uh, yeah, there is, there is something like eerie about, water it's like you're so helpless in it and like the thought of uh something else being in there that you couldn't get away from if you wanted to is oh, yeah. like terrifying no chance like the beach is like i'll never go if i go to the ocean i'll never go where my feet can't touch and even then once i'm past the waist dude i'm like i'm a goner if i see like a shark like nothing there's no hope you don't stand a chance against aquatic animals. No, we are t- terrible in water. We're not <laughs> real good on land either. I mean, we're yeah. kind of helpless, helpless critters. Uh, one time, April and I were in Florida. We we went on a couple of trips, like early on in our relationship to West Palm Beach, which is just north of Miami. Mm-hmm. And this was actually the trip where we ended up getting engaged. But I remember at one point we were at the. It's like Singer Island, which is like right on the coast. And we were in the water. It's right near the inlet into the, you know, the inland channel where all the boats and stuff go. And we're in a probably like chest deep water, just kind of hanging out and stuff. And I remember like looking over and just seeing this enormous dark spot in the water. And just like straight panic for for a good 10 seconds like 
what is it? What is it? What is it? I mean, it was huge, you know, and we were like freaking out trying to figure out. I mean, you know, we're not close to shore. It's just like you said. I mean, you're not going to beat whatever it is. If it wants you, it's going to have you. Oh, yeah. And so like right about the time that I was thinking about, you know, just sort of pushing April towards it and then running. (laughs) Like two big doughy nostrils came out of the water and it was a manatee. Really? That's kind of yeah. cool, though. It was cool. It was the yeah. second half of the story. Very cool. First half terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> How close were you to it? Was it like real close? Oh, it seemed close at the time. It was probably I bet you we were probably like 20 or 30 feet. Did you mistake it for a mermaid? Isn't that what people mistake for like mistook for mermaids? Is that what was it manatees? Probably. I mean, they like, like nothing like what you think mermaids are, but I feel like that's the old tale. Be like, oh, I thought I saw a mermaid. Turns out it was just like this frumpy ass manatee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a manatee is just like a floating dough ball. Yeah, they're goofy. Like, they're, they're such cool animals, but like, again, like so helpless. <laughs> when it comes to like us just like getting hit by boats yeah. and everything. <laughs> That's not funny. It's terrible. I don't yeah. know why I'm laughing. <laughs> yeah, it would have been cool to get a little closer to it, but I feel like that's uh, very frowned upon. Yeah. Actually, I remember like n- not too many years ago, there was a video that came out of, I think it was a manatee and it was like some dopey Midwestern tourist like holding on to it and like, letting it pull them at the beach really? and people like freaked out at them. Yeah. I mean, that seems like a dumb thing to do. I, what if it just dove underwater and just took him down with him and he just drowned right there? Do you think people would have loved the video then? I don't know. I mean, there's so many people who cares. <laughs> What's one less idiot. <laughs> it's funny how much you value uh, individuals. But then when you're talking about the group as a whole, you're kind of like, yeah, I don't care. We could lose a few. Oh, yeah. I mean, anytime you read about someone who died like this insane death, you get like you you instantly crack a smile. You're like, it's sad that he died, but like can't can't stop smiling. Like it's funny. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's a. Uh... Yeah, I, I think I, we were at. So last night we everything is pretty much opened up and back to normal here completely. Yeah. And uh we stopped last night to get some carry out from Buffalo Wild Wings and it was so packed. I mean, it was just completely packed full of people waiting for carry out. And they had like two people working the, the, the carry out desk. And it's so loud in there anyways, that they're like trying to take orders over the phone and stuff. And the, the poor girl that was like running the register and stuff. She had a, she was on a crutch and and literally holding two phones while people like stared at her and like tapped their feet. Oh and those are God. the situations where I'm like, yeah, we could. I don't know. We could lose a few. It'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's a nightmare scenario right there. And those people like that is I swear, like when it comes to stress in like the mental toll that takes on you way harder than my job. I bet that person gets paid a little bit less like just to answer phones for like food orders and stuff. Like they're not getting paid great at Buffalo Wild Wings, but they're literally just like dealing with terrible ass people all day long. It's pretty yeah. weird. Yeah. I did demand to see the manager like while I was standing there with everything going on. He's like, I need to talk to the manager because oh they had like messed. They had gotten the increment of his order wrong. He had ordered like 12 and they accidentally only gave him six and, and they're like, hey, well, you know, we, we'll fix it for you. We're sorry, but, you know, we're going to have to cook those. So it's going to be it's going to be a little bit yet. And he's like, yeah, I need to see the manager. And I'm like, I, what what is it going to do? What are you going to do? It's like, we'll just give you the raw frozen chicken and you can just cook it in your toaster oven at home. Maybe you have an air fryer. People seem to like those these days. Use one of those. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or just eat it raw. And then there's yeah. one less due to salmonella, you know? Yeah, dude, speaking of Buffalo Wild Wings, I saw an ad pop up on like Facebook for them recently. And like, a, it was like for a specific one in my area. There's only one really in my area. And 
all the comments on it were like, ordered online, like had it, I think they did, were doing deliver or something during COVID, whatever. Maybe they did it through um, Uber, Eat, whatever those like DoorDash. I don't know. There's like a few. And it was like a dozen comments of people being like, yeah, you know, I uh, I ordered from them and I got my chicken and it was still cold and raw in the middle. I'm like a dozen comments like that. I don't know if people were just like piggybacking <laughs> off the first one, trying to be funny and fuck with their like reviews or something. But I was like, that's a, I'm not going to go there now. Like it worked, whatever. I mean, I'm not going to that Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> yeah. Chicken's not a thing you mess around with. What's yeah, a, you, Okay. Talking about plug and play identities. Yeah. Right. Since cowboy you're an ex cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, give me, okay. Describe for me and knowing that I am one. Okay. Describe for I don't me. I like role play Casey the average Buffalo Wild Wings customer who's there on a Tuesday night for half price wings, sitting in the bar, watching sports. All just, I know just describe the person. Yeah. I mean, he's got, there's a, there's a goatee. There's some sort of facial hair going on that doesn't like connect up the side of his face to his side. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, <laughs> and on the shirt, absolutely something patriotic could be an Eagle. It, it could be like a, just an American flag on the back with like way too many words going from like the top of it all the way to the bottom. And uh, maybe some boot cut jeans, some boots. That's the guy I'm thinking of. Okay. Who comes here's, to your here's mine. <laughs> mine is uh, he's, he's uh, like mid to late twenties. Hmm. Um, rocking like spiky new metal <laughs> fatigues hair. Fatigues is another one. I bet there's a lot of dudes in fatigues. <laughs> I want to say he's got like what looks to be a basketball jersey on, but it's not for a team. It says like Rockstar Energy on it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a flat brim, something motocross related, like Fox Racing or something. Um, he drives a diesel truck. It's lifted. It's got big wheels with the center caps are like silver stars. And he has like a cartoon emblem of the shocker. Okay, on yeah. The back window. <laughs> That's a good one. That's really specific. The only other thing that comes to my mind is like inside of one of those buildings is at least 60% tap out t-shirts or other paraphernalia. Oh yeah, that's my guy right there. Yeah. <laughs> They're there for the fight for sure. That Doesn't Midwest matter which butt fight. rock they just, aesthetic. Yeah. They just want to watch two shirtless dudes grapple each other and be like, I'm not. And then like, but also be homophobic on the side, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he, he snuck an Avenged Sevenfold into his wedding rotation. Yeah. Speak, you had uh speaking of wedding, you, didn't you have, um, your wedding was catered by Buffalo Wild Wings, wasn't it? You did. Something- <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't afford catering or else I would have considered that option. Do you have someone manning a grill? Was that your wedding? We do literally just had dessert and it was like we or we bought a wedding cake, uh, like a fairly cheap one. And then a bunch of like her, our relatives are mostly April's relatives because it was in New Jersey, but they brought desserts and then we just had like dessert, dessert hangout afterwards. Because if you can't dance and you can't drink then what are you doing after the wedding anyways? You know, you're just kind of like hanging around for a few minutes to say thank you. And then off you go, man, that is a, that's a bold move, you know, just doing desserts. People got you wedding gifts. Did they, when they left, did they take their gifts back or did you guys get to keep them? (laughs) Oh no, no, we kept them. Yeah. No one was like, you know, I, uh, I, got him a card. I put some money in it. I bought him a toaster oven and, uh, and I got a uh, cherry cobbler from uh, the local grocery store. Yeah. They weren't like, they didn't expect like, you know, most people expect like to be fed and, you know, have, yeah, at like, least get their money. You got a it. nice dessert. I'm sorry that you didn't get some like dry fish or some semi-cooked like Hawaiian chicken. You miserable prick. <laughs> No, dude, my, I didn't do, uh, we had the bar at my wedding, but we didn't do open bar. Uh, I was too concerned. We, well, we couldn't afford it, but we didn't want to pay to close. You have to pay to close a bar. And, um, and just, we didn't feel like doing, I, I don't think we did that. And 
now I'm like rethinking all of it and I'm wondering, maybe we did close the bar. I don't really remember my wedding at all. It's a total blur because weddings, sorry, if anyone's out there is getting married, it's not that fun. It's mostly a chore. No, it's stressful. Yeah. Like ours was pretty good by wedding standards, I think. But even still, it's like you are just like blasting through the day. And then oh, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I remember we left directly from the wedding to go to Florida for our honeymoon because we went to like Disney World. Yep. And we got to the airport, got through security and stuff like that. And like somewhere in between, we realized that all we had eaten is desserts <laughs> for like 12 hours. And so like by the time we got to our gate, we just felt like we were going to pass out. Like <laughs> we were both just like nauseous and, and exhausted. <laughs> and yeah, that's I, I feel like people are really like stuck on the idea of weddings and I get like, I get that that's a big deal for, for some people, but I always tell people, I'm like, man, go on an awesome trip, go on the vacation that you'll never get to, that you might not get to do for another 10, 15 years. Like just go all out on that and then take the rest and put it in your account so you can go to, you know, put some down on a house or something like that afterwards. Yeah. I mean, we, we didn't pay a lot for ours. I know my in-laws helped out a good bit. It was like, we, we went, we didn't go big by any means, but it like, I just, I, I've been to weddings where the bride and the groom are having the time of their life too. So also you can have a big wedding. You can do whatever you want. I don't give a shit. I'm not really going to advise you either way, but I've been to enough weddings where everyone was having a good time. I felt like with mine, it was like, you know, you make your rounds to every table. I, I didn't drink at the time. Like I didn't have, like we had our, like some of our friends there, of course, but it wasn't, it just didn't have that like fun, like party vibe. Like some weddings you go to where you're like, this is just, it feels like a party. Everyone's dressed up. It's a good time. Uh, and I've definitely been to those. Ours wasn't, Ours wasn't like that, but I think it's just because that's the type of people, you know, we, I don't, I don't know if I want to say the type of people we were, but we weren't like party people. We were like, we're going to do this nice wedding. We didn't have, our friends weren't like, no one was really, dr- we got married so young and we were still so like, not really drinking. Like I had just turned 21. Like my first beer was three days before my wedding. So like, I wasn't exactly getting like turned up or whatever, like three days later. And uh, it would have been funny that that would have been a better story if like I had my first beer at 21, then got married three days later and just like was an absolute fucking train wreck at my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I only remember going to one wedding that I thought was fun. And that was Chad's. Yeah. I had a good time at his wedding, but that four? was it. Yeah. Yeah. Our buddy Chad, he had a, he had rented a, a whale stomach, wedding. right? He rented out a whale stomach and. Right, right. You guys just party down that, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By and large, weddings are either fun for the bride and groom, or they're fun for the uh, the attendees. Yeah, or they're fun for no one. <laughs> <laughs> I officiated a wedding, my uh, my brother in laws, and that was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Like he had, I feel like his wedding had like over. 250 people it was like pushing 300 or something it was crazy and i might be exaggerating i have no idea how many people were there the entire night was also a blur and it had nothing to do with how much i was drinking it was like just standing there doing that was like i mean public speakers man like pastors who do weddings and funerals and they do this. They just get up in front of people all the time and run their mouth. And they're like, this is cool. Like they don't think twice about it. They don't get nervous. There's like a public speaking gene. I swear to God. And I would like to see someone do a study on this because I don't think it's possible for me to just like do it enough where I get used to it. I think I'll always like, yeah, you terrified. Would. Yeah, maybe it's a, it's all in just doing it a bunch. Like I do a, a lot of public speaking. And it really just comes down to like, like you never, you're never going to feel prepared for it, you know, Yeah. but you just develop the reflex to like get up there and talk and like work your way through the situation. 
So I feel like I should be paying you for your time now. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you do my, for like, my coaching skill. I, yeah, I'm going to start. How much a, do I owe you? Do you yeah, do, I'm going to uh, do like I'll start like a skill share, skill share channel or something like that. Yeah, start Patreon, man. Learn how to uh, learn how to publicly speak. It's just me and Gary V, twin <laughs> douchebags. <laughs> I don't know who Gary V is. That's fine. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the real person it's, uh, well, uh, yeah I, he's usually, a real ab- okay. he's a real abrasive uh like motivational speaker he's one of those like there's a business l- lurking in everybody okay you so know, this is just one another one of those classic references of yours that are completely lost on me is what this was yes i mean he is a very popular public <laughs> figure but yeah one of my obscure references okay maybe it's not obscure maybe i'm <laughs> maybe i'm the one who's a little off base here dude I hate, okay, strong, strong words, but I dislike motivational speakers. Yeah. I don't like good. them. It reminds me of like uh, annoying pastors. pastors. Yeah. 100%. I don't like them and I don't want to hear anyone make a sports analogy. Like sports analogies make me want to like throw myself out a window. And Yeah, they fall every, flat on me. Most pastors and especially assistant pastors, like if the assistant pastor is speaking at the ch- at your parents' church this week when you decided to go, all it's going to be is a bunch of uh, football analogies. And I hate, hate them. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I swear when I was um, like in my days of inviting people to church, I, you always like talk your church up like, you know, this is a great, it's great. Pastor is great. It's different. Ours is different. You know, whatever you, you'd give everyone the, the full lecture on why your church is special and that they should give it a shot. And I, I'm almost positive every time I've ever done that and people actually came to church with me, it was always not the pastor preaching. And then, I'd be like, and then I have to like double back and explain myself. Like, well, it's a little different this time because uh, the pastor wasn't, oh my God, it was always terrible. Yeah, you got to go to one of those churches where they have like 30 people on staff and you're like, what do these people do all the time? Yeah. Like they're all full-time employees of the church. This guy feels like he didn't practice at all for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw the, I, my, you know what the best fucking thing about being a pastor is if you're like at a bigger church or a real one uh denominationally affiliated they'll do sabbaticals where it's like your job is to speak in front of people once a week you sp- you pr- you have an entire week to prepare 40 minutes worth of material and it's most of it's written for you right there's a lot of words in the bible a lot of it's written for you and at most of these churches, you can just read a verse, make a joke, do a shitty sports analogy, and then make it somehow applicable to somebody's like everyday life, like not being a dickhead to your cube mate or some shit. And then you you do that. And then after you do that for a few years, you're like, listen, man, you've been working really hard. You should have four months off paid at a really fucking nice place. Just beautiful. <laughs> right. and, and you just look, you need to unwind. You really do because dealing with us is hard. So we're going to pay you to just disappear for four months. Turn off your phone. It's like we're, we won't contact you unless it's an absolute emergency. And I mean, what a good gig. I need it. It does seem all right. Yeah. Pastors jokes are like canned too. There's just a list of them that they refer back to all the time. Like uh, whenever the subject of like, like happiness in marriage comes up like every pastor has to make a joke about like well you know uh if your uh if your wife is a little upset with you you know you just you just give them some chocolate you know women love chocolate they i'll tell you women they love chocolate yeah (laughs) oh man oh my god this is miserable i i'm not gonna get into it now because we uh we've been talking for a little bit and we should close out introduce our guest whatever but um one of the reasons i and the last like the, the church that i had gone to in boston I've, I've been meaning to like just mention this story a little bit and maybe i'll get into it uh, next next episode uh but the last straw for me there was like this um where i was like i can't do this anymore it was like was a 
teaching on biblical gender roles and and, and marriage. Oh, cool. And and, yeah. And I was, <laughs> it was like probably like a four or five week series. I mean, I might have mentioned dive. this like at the beginning of like when we started this thing, but I was like, I left. I, I had to walk out. I remember it was like a summer day. Like I walked outside and just missed the rest of it. I was like, I can't sit through another one of these sermons like that and that was when i that was like the first time that i realized a significant change had taken place in me uh because you know the year before that i wouldn't i might have been like i don't know but not so it would have like hit me in such a way i would have had a visceral reaction the way that i did where i had to like get up and leave so you had a choice ahead of you it was get up and leave or put the cowboy hat back on and just (laughs) and lean in that cowboy hat was still at my parents' house at that point. I left it there when I moved out. <laughs> it was there for probably a while. I'm guessing it's gone now. I did the move that everybody does where you like leave your parents' house and for a while they're like, hey, maybe you should go through your stuff. And you're like, look, I've been gone for six years and I haven't thought about it. I don't want to look at it. If it's there, just put it in the garbage. That's fine. <laughs> it's Well... Don't worry, I I know where they sell them, so we can we can get you back back set up with one. Yeah, yeah. You follow them on uh, follow their eBay account or something. <laughs> oh, there's there's multiple cowboy hat vendors here. Yeah. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, you're you're just looking out for the cowboy hat. I could become the cowboy hat guy again. That's fine. I'm all about it. No, I'm not. <laughs> all right, our guest today is Peter Espival. Yeah. A lot of you might not be super familiar with him unless you were part of like the whole big into Christian metal like Casey and I were. Um, But he is from Norway. He he was in a band called Extol and they they broke into the U.S. scene in the late kind of like the late 90s. Uh, We kind of get into the history of the band a little bit uh, or a lot of it. And um, it was just a fun conversation. He's had a lot happen to him. He's had a lot of change in his faith and his understanding of it. And some of that had to do with, you know, just his experiences in the U S um, their experience as a, a metal band in Norway was interesting in that, you know, metal and Christianity didn't always mesh over there. So Norway is where the black metal scene started, yeah. where they burned a whole bunch of old churches. There was some murders and stuff. So it was a, not a friendly place to be a Christian musician at the time. Yeah. Uh, Sam and I've talked about it before, but like Christian metal in the like two thousands range was really good. I mean, for if you were into metal core and stuff like that, there was a ton of Christian bands that were in it and they were mainstream. It wasn't like, there's this whole separate segment of bands that are for Christian people to listen to. I mean, they, they got mainstream popularity within that scene. And X toll was kind of like a foundational group to that whole movement. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, really interesting story. Really cool guy talks a little bit about uh, his struggles with, with mental health and his family and, um, I don't know, just really cool. Uh, he also has a new music project, yes. which we will link to in the description. Uh, they've got a new single coming out, and you should definitely go check that out. Uh, yeah, we'll link to that too. Um, it's Harada, H-R-A-D-A. It's a Nor- old Norwegian word. He explains it in the episode, so I'll let him do that, and I'm not going to try because I'm going to sound like an idiot. <laughs> So everyone enjoy our conversation with Peter. Uh, Also, if you haven't, we know uh, there's enough listeners out there where it's disproportional to the number of five star reviews we have on iTunes. So maybe just think about giving that a chance, Uh, uh, leaving us a little review, saying something nice, be super helpful for us. Maybe not for you, you, but pray about it. Yeah. Give it it up to God. You I know what? Give it up idea. to God. And if you feel so led, go go drop us a review on iTunes. Don't and, do it in uh, tongues, though. Like, people won't understand it. So maybe just use English. It'll probably be yeah. And I don't want to I don't want to make promises, but I think we can assume that you'll get a crown in heaven. 
for doing so. You know, it's just uh, it's of yeah. high importance to the big man. So yeah, yeah, it'll um, or it's, it's like seed money, but it's it costs less. So just do it. <laughs> so many terms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Anyway, here's our conversation with Peter. Hey, everybody, we're back with our guest, Peter Espival. Peter is hanging out with us uh, all the way from Norway in a cabin in the woods, which sounds like a pretty cool place to be right now. <laughs> How's it going, Peter? Hey, I'm fine. How are you guys? Good, good. Yeah, so a cabin in the mountains is basically where you always want to be, right? Um, at least for me, having uh, three, three kids and just way too much work all the time. And uh, so just retreating back to the mountains. So that's, that's where we want to be. <laughs> what's yeah. what's like your mountain hangout activity? Are you a big hiker or fishing? Or? Yeah, fishing uh, mostly, yeah. Um, but I, I like to hike as well. And then, yeah, usually I try to get some, some uh, jogging uh, <laughs> around as well. You know, it's so beautiful to take a, a nice long jog up in the mountains on these uh, nice trails and everything. So, yeah. But fishing is definitely yeah, my, sure like, my main thing. You know, there's this beautiful mountain trout in these uh, small lakes up here. So, yeah, just beautiful. There was like this uh, Disney Plus had this. Uh, it was like a short nature series. It was like three episodes that was all about like Scandinavia and that area up there. Right. And um I was I was like shocked at how much just like vast open country there is yeah. in the northern parts of Scandinavia. It sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, it's so sweet. I mean, the the density of people here is just. I mean, <laughs> there's literally no people here, right? <laughs> Compared to like many places in the world. So we have, as I said, these vast uh, areas of, of beautiful nature and beautiful mountains and uh, you know lakes and rivers and yeah. So it's pretty sweet. Yeah, that's my vacation goal is like, I'm going to try to go a whole week without speaking to anyone other than to like order food and say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, come over. We'll take you on a good fishing trip. And uh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Sounds right up Casey's alley. <laughs> I haven't fished in 20 years. So <laughs> well, it's about time then. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I know. I'm starting to think about all the, the stuff I missed out on that I didn't want to do when I was younger because I thought it was boring. And now I'm not in like great enough shape to like want to like do anything too active. I'm like, oh, like like fishing sounds great. Golf sounds wonderful. Like all the things that I just passed on right. and I really wish I did. <laughs> uh, so, Peter, to get into it, you uh, I mean, your your claim to fame for those in the metal world would be um, your would be your band Extol. And, you know, I feel like there, there's a lot of questions that I, I, I personally have around that. But, um, you know, I know you guys were on Solid State and kind of got into the Christian the Christian metal scene kind of out here in the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, I, one of the things that I'm curious about is what your introduction to, to faith was. Uh, my understanding is, and, you know, jump in and, and correct any misunderstanding that I might have is that the metal scene where you're from isn't exactly, doesn't have like open arms for, for Christianity or Christian bands. Um, <laughs> so kind of like having your faith and getting into music, I'm kind of interested what the start of that was um, and, and how you, what, what was your introduction to faith? Was it family? Was it something you found on your own? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm born and raised into, into Christianity, right? Um uh, my, my family, you know, we were brought up in a sort of like a Pentecostal Assemblies of God sort of tradition. Um, plus, my parents were missionaries. So uh, four years, you know, when I was one and two years old. And then again, when I was uh, nine, ten years old, we uh, we lived in East Africa. So we lived uh, two years in Congo and two years in Kenya. Uh, and in between that, wow. you know, we were really, yeah, my, my parents were really involved in, in the Pentecostal church, our local Pentecostal church. And um, and so were we, you know, when we came back from Kenya, you know, I was, you know, starting to, to become a little bit older. And um, yeah, quite early on, I think, even before that, like when I was eight, seven, eight, nine, I, I sort of decided, you know, I want to, yeah, this Christianity thing that. That's probably something for me, right? So, you know, tagging along and everything. And after a while, 
becoming a, a teenager, uh, taking and getting responsibility in the church, uh, you know, as a youth leader, worship leader. I suddenly did worship when I was 14 years old. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's it's been a really big part of uh, since since I was born, I guess. Yeah, you know, when you have uh, parents that are missionaries, you know, that's where you are. <laughs> it's all about uh, that, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it like a rite of passage in Norway for teenagers to burn a church down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could think so back in the you know early 90s, that's for sure. Um, well, uh, the thing was, uh, obviously, uh, you have seen the stories, right, about uh, the burning of the churches and, and there were some, you know, killings and, and stuff like that. Uh, it was... Uh, of course crazy but also it was a big uh, it was hyped a lot by the by the national media uh, and then obviously got a lot of attention out of norway uh, into europe and the u.s and everything and it, it blew blew up right uh of course i'm not saying it wasn't like crazy i mean there were some some really beautiful extremely old churches that was burned to the ground and, and which is just sad um but you know norway has this um uh yeah norway is quite uh, has been quite religious uh, in some sense like the the state church has been quite strong uh in in the culture and and like when you uh, up to quite recently when like when you're born you're born into the state church you have to actively sort of uh say no <laughs> when you're born like or yeah. the parents need to say no if you don't want to become a member of the of the state church so it's been quite, you know, this strong uh, tradition. And um, obviously, if you're not into that, you know, I, I can understand people uh, think that, you know, not the right uh, being born into that church. I mean, if you don't believe you, you don't want to be born into a church. Uh, so understandably enough, there has been quite a lot of um, um, anger and, and uh, you know, um, yeah, people who want to, to work against that. So um yeah yeah does it seem like some of the uh maybe even some of the hostility and resistance towards it is just because the default is uh you're just in and that that's something that yeah like if that wasn't the case and it hadn't been the case for a while do you think that there would there'd be such a, a vocal yeah uh, hostility or right like, like for example now it's been some years and and um and yeah now you're not really born into the church anymore and and i don't feel see that there are that many uh, uh, groups that are really, you know, uh, fuck the church, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's mellowed out a little bit, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Was, so I, were you, did you grow up during any of that time period or catch like the tail end of the whole black metal thing yeah. and where like, I feel like our, like most of us here are, unless somebody got into black metal at some point, like most of us here that have a, any sort of idea what happened? It's all from that documentary. Uh, Until the light takes us. Yeah. If you're familiar with yeah. that, but- I mean, we we were in the middle of it, right? So we started the band in 1994, uh, which was basically the peak of of the whole black metal, you know, craziness. Um, so to to me or to us, you know, we were really, you know. Um, kind uh nice boys who just wanted to to sh- you know sh- show people love and and you know we're all about uh all about that uh, and then our church obviously didn't really understand the death metal concept right um so they 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 backed us in some sense that you know they let us rehearse in the church and stuff like that but they, they didn't understand what we were doing and the screaming thing, of course, was a little bit off. You know, it was too, a little bit too much, right? Uh, so, so, so I mean, yeah. <laughs> we had that on the one side. Uh, and, and, of course, many Christians were like, okay, this is satanic. You can't do this, period, you know. So we had that. And then, but we also wanted to, to we didn't want to stay in the church environment. We wanted to hang out with the black metal people, right? Uh, and the metal people in, in Oslo um, and in Norway and and. Uh, you know, they didn't want to have anything to do with us, us either. <laughs> so we were sort of in between there where uh, it was quite some, some tensions, but it was also a very exciting place to be, right? Uh, where you, you sort of feel, you know, 
yeah, there, there is something we can do here. We can hopefully we can try to bring some of these uh, uh, outer sites a little bit closer together and uh, uh, yeah. But it, it, for sure, it was a crazy, crazy time. Um, yeah, but my, my way into hard music was actually um, Jerusalem, the Swedish uh, rock band. I don't know whether you heard of them. Or, yeah, um, I remember very vividly my first encounter with them. I, I, I w- woke up uh, a Saturday morning, and my father, um, I think he had some friends over Friday night. Um, and so my parents were sleeping. I, I woke up early, came down to the kitchen, and then I saw this cassette uh, tape uh, laying on the next to the cassette player. Uh, and on the cover of that cassette, there was um, just a really close-up picture of Uffe, the, the vocalist of Jerusalem, really sweaty and long hair, and you know, looking really, you know, just yeah. It, I was excited. So I, I put it <laughs> put on the cassette, and it was um, it was a cassette called In His Majesty's Service, which was uh, I think it was a live recording from the Cornerstone Festival. And yeah, Cornerstone, yeah. And I put it on. I was all alone in the kitchen. Put it on, and was like <laughs> mind blown. You know, wow, this <laughs> this was awesome. And you know, from there it didn't take very many years. Where it started just you know, what it you wanted just to get harder and harder and harder, right? And ended up with a proper uh, death metal and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, did you get into black metal at any point, or was that sort of a off-putting because of everything going on? It wasn't so off-putting uh, in terms of, of what was going on, because I mean, we knew a lot of these black metal guys, right? We we, we saw them at, at you know concerts and, and bars and wherever we we were hanging out. Uh, and knew some of them personally from other bands and that we played with and stuff like that. So it wasn't off-putting in that sense so much. Uh, it was more of, I didn't really like the black metal style. I thought it was way too, uh, you know, simplistic and, 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 you know, no interesting melodies and harmonies. And, and yeah, so to me, uh, I just thought it was a little bit boring. Yeah. Uh, but, but. I'm just going to say it. Black metal is the worst sub genre of metal it's terrible <laughs> yes. and, and and the fan base is like the meanest of of all of them like <laughs> that's like the one segment of metal that i've just never found a band that i'm like oh i i mean this is okay yeah. like every black metal band i listen to i'm like skip <laughs> yeah, I, I i tend to agree with you uh there are of course some you know that that's more the you know, technical, melodic, yeah, black metal kind of bands, but there are not too many that I really enjoy. So, I, I, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So if you started, like, you said you started the band in 94, um, and then you, that's when you kind of started hanging out and, like, trying to play in, with some of the other bands, hang, what, doing bar shows, things like that. When did you start picking up, um, when did Extol start picking up, like, momentum? Oh, that was for sure. I mean... Uh, we released our first album in 1998, uh, the Burial album, okay. and this is a crazy story. I think we should take time for it because it was it was so weird. Uh, we yeah. Cornerstone for us, like since '94, Cornerstone was just, you know in our minds just heaven on earth, right? Because in Norway you you didn't get these big alternative uh, Christian festivals. Uh, you had one festival, but it was like you know maybe a couple of hard bands, and it was just yeah. <laughs> everything else right uh but like cornerstone we, you know all our, our the bands that we listen to the christian metal bands you know everything from striper to to living sacrifice and vengeance and more i mean everyone was there right um so we were like okay in 1998 uh we we, we were going to cornerstone um and then we also got a gig booked at something called texas rock fest i don't know if you guys okay. uh, are oh, not familiar with that no. <laughs> how old are you guys <laughs> 33. Yeah, 33. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, I mean, uh, we thought it was a, a semi-big festival, and we were told, like, it's going to be, like, you know, 5,000 people there. And, oh, yeah, cool, that, that's, that's awesome. Uh, and then, uh, so, so we were having this festival first, and then we were going to the Cornerstone afterwards. And when we were flying out of Oslo, we came to, to Amsterdam, and then there was, um, uh, they had overbooked the flight. So, um we uh, volunteered to take a, a, a later flight because we got like a couple hundred bucks each and we we're like, yeah, free money, that's perfect. And we weren't in a hurry. <laughs> but that led to us um, 
flying into Austin instead of uh, another Texas city. And at the airport in Austin, where we weren't supposed to be, we met in the middle of the night in the airport, we met a Lament, a Mexican Christian death metal band. And we saw like they, we had Christian band t-shirts, they had Christian metal band t-shirts. So we were like, hey, hey, start talking. And they said, yeah, we're, we're playing at Cornerstone. And we're like, oh, awesome. We're playing at Texas Rockfest. And then we're coming to Cornerstone afterwards. And then they said, oh, are you playing at Cornerstone? Oh, yeah, we wish. You know, that would be our dream. Hey, right, you can play at our set. Uh, okay. Yeah. What? We have like, I think they said we have like three hour sets, but we will only play for one and a half hours. So you can play after us. Uh, but that was at the HM stage, like the heaven metal stage. So they said you, mm-hmm. you probably have to to talk to Doug Van Pelt, the editor of the of the HM uh, magazine, at first. Okay, we were really psyched. We came to Texas Rockfest. It was not five thousand people. It was forty two people. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic yeah. music festival overhype right there. Yep. <laughs> Did they try to make you pre-sell tickets in Norway for it? (laughs) So obviously we were a little bit bummed out. On the other side, it was the first time we were in the U.S. We were playing with our band. It was awesome. Uh, But we were playing on Saturday, and Doug Van Pelt was there on Friday. But he was leaving, you know, Friday night. So there was this other band playing on Friday that said, hey, uh, you can play a couple of songs on our set so that Doug Van Pelt can see you, so that he can decide whether or not you can play on Cornstone. Uh, and uh, we cl- played a couple of songs on Friday night. Doug saw it. He loved it. And he said, yeah, sure. If Lament wants to share the stage with you, sure, go ahead. Um, I'm going to make this uh, story uh, shorter now. So um, when we finally came to Cornstone, our, um, we were um, signed to a Swedish uh, uh, record label. So the, the record label guy, he went to to um, uh, the Tooth and Nail Solid State uh, guy um, and said, hey, you got to see this band. Uh, and we went on stage like two o'clock at night, I think, after Lament was finished and, you know, did our windmill thing, you know, the proper, you know, the proper metal thing. Not, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and at that time, you know, all the metal, you know, it was dead like the way we saw it because everything was about the hardcore uh, and metalcore sort of thing. So, and I think it had been dead for some years because when people saw our windmill thing, everybody just went nuts. And uh, so <laughs> uh, Brandon Ebel from, from Tooth Nail, he, he, he you know, looked over to, to the, the Swedish uh, label manager and said, hey, yeah, we got a deal. We, we, we're signing this band. So long story for telling you how, wow. when it sort of, uh, you know, uh, started to to gain some proper traction. That was actually after that show when when Tooth Nail and Solid State picked us up, and then the following album, Under Seed, was was you know the 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 album that really sort of took off for us in in the US. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, man, that all happened pretty quick. I mean, that was so much like happenstance. And yeah. That, you said it was your first time in the US. Yeah, yeah. It was crazy. Uh, 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 How cool yeah. are those bands too? <laughs> Uh, oh yeah he, even uh, first of all the three hour set thing so i never actually made it to cornerstone it was like the big it was like i don't know heavy music mecca for a lot of people when like i was in college uh casey paid to play there i'm pretty sure right? i did <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know anything about it it's like hey we, you know you can go to cornerstone and there's these generator stages right and you message the guy in charge that's on the website and you can tell you know and so every one of them's like yeah you can play our our stage <laughs> you know you just it's gonna be a hundred bucks or it's gonna be 250 bucks or whatever so i booked us like one stage a day at cornerstone on these generator stages yeah and there, there was one that we played the first one we played was awesome it, and we we were right before uh my children, my bride. Yep. So there was a pretty good, pretty good crowd there and stuff. Every one of them after that was literally just a generator and a Walmart PA system. Right. And they're like, yeah. all right, uh, I, I remember, have at it. I remember those <laughs> stages. <laughs> There's like 30 Christian metal bands in a row yeah. all playing at the same time. So it just sounds like... It just sounds like 40 garbage disposals running yep. at the same time. <laughs> I can't believe they had three-hour sets that people were able to just, like, give away time on. Yeah. I feel like they 
as time went on with the festival, especially because festivals started really start Cornerstone's not even around anymore, but yeah. they started like so many festivals struggle to make money that they're like trying to jam pack everything in and like the ticket prices kind of sky. Yeah. It was it's interesting what happened to music festivals, but that is crazy that you just ran into a band. They're like, you could just take some of our stage. Uh, that happened twice. It's so crazy. And I mean, um, the crazy thing, this is 1998, right? I mean, we weren't on the internet or anything. So everything like, uh, why did we recognize Lament and they recognize us? It was because of, we were sending out demo tapes to small metal signs uh, and metal signs were actually printed and it was shipped to Mexico and to Norway. And I mean, it was just, it was such a crazy time. Um, really charming. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's not like that anymore, right? Everything is just everywhere now. Yeah. <laughs> so you probably got to play alongside some bands that you guys listen to Anyways, I mean, that had to be pretty exciting. Yeah, huh? for sure. I, I don't really remember who was playing that year and who we saw. Everything is a little bit in a blur because it was just such a big ex- experience to us. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, o- over the years, we toured US uh, like five, six times or something. So um, yeah, we played with uh, yeah some of the bands that we really enjoyed when we were younger. And, and yeah, it's been pretty cool. Yeah. So was it when you're kind of starting out and you're trying to like, when you're trying to grow your thing and you're looking to make really, I mean, I guess the goal is to make a career out of, out of being a musician. Is it, is the U S on like everyone's radar or is it kind of, I mean, other areas of Europe do those, is that kind of where some people dream of going or is, is there something about metal like and the way that the metal scene was taking off in the U S um, in a, in reaching high, definitely higher levels of popularity. I mean, now it's almost mainstream, not so much the type of metal that you guys are doing, but metal core really yeah. took metal into a, a mainstream thing. But was the U S like the bit the, a big goal for a lot of people, or is it not really that important for some and it depending on the kind of genre you're in? I think it depends a lot of what kind of genre you're in and you know, what time you're playing. Um, so for us, uh, when we did the undeceived album, uh, we, we, you know, could really see that we hit hit a nerve somehow. Uh, as I said a little bit earlier, I think it was people had had this uh, hardcore metalcore thing for a while, and then suddenly there was this Scandinavian band with their, you know, really long hair doing the windmill headbanging, and you know, with proper, you know, proper death metal, technical, me- melodic. Uh, so we really hit something there, but but our problem is that we. <laughs> we don't stick to one genre, right? Our albums are really different yeah. from, from album to album. So when we then, after Undeceived the released Synergy, which is a really technical thrash, uh, more of a thrash approach, really different vocals, then, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of people fell off, right? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so so it, I don't think in the US that record did really so well, maybe better in, in Europe, actually. Um, and then obviously our blueprint album after that was completely different again with, with uh, more of a rock, um, you know, attitude. Um, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of metal bands obviously want to do well in, in the U S but with the, with the scene in the U S last 25 years, you, you almost have to play, you know, quite, uh, yeah, a little bit simpler, uh, metal core sort of music to, to, to do really well, I think. Yeah, I mean, there was always like the a few like Scandinavian bands that were like huge on everyone's right. Like in, I remember like when all like everyone was like in flames is always. I mean, they're just a yeah. world tour kind of band anyway. You know, yeah, I like in them, flames like, a lot. Yeah, and there's always those ones. So like that's kind of, I feel like the big ones that kind of uh, are often assumed to be the the big representation for that type of music. It's always fairly like pretty technical and and heavy. I don't know. So it's it. it that's kind of what got adapted here in the U S yeah. that's what even the people who played music, those were their influences in yeah. metal. And you would kind of see like the shreddiness find its way into certain aspects of metal core too, based on. Yeah. Those I, types I think of in, but those in were the and, uh, and at the gate, obviously have had a huge impact uh, on the U S metal scene. Uh, and then it's been a little bit Americanized <laughs> and then, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Casey. I didn't know. I, I'm just <laughs> just sitting here with my mouth open like a dummy. <laughs> so after like so you I mean you mentioned after um like Blueprint I, so my even my introduction real like that's that was the album that like I had heard and was like oh wow this is 
Me the, too. That was the one that stuck with me. That was one of the first ones I got into. And then I went through the whole back catalog. Uh, I was also, your other stuff was before, a little ahead of my time. I didn't really find heavy music until I was in high school. And I mean, you guys have already been putting out albums before that. So after that, so that after Blueprint came out, did you, you guys did a lot of US tour. Did you do per, most of your touring in the US at that point? Yeah, we, we, we tried to do sort of like a summer tour uh, for every album uh, in the U.S. And then I, I think, was it five tours we had? Something like that. So um, um, so the, the Blueprint tour we, was in 2005, I think. Um, okay, yeah. And it was just the biggest disaster in the whole world when it comes to touring. Yeah, it was a major major disaster <laughs> like what went wrong uh, everything went wrong everything that could go wrong went wrong um we were signed to both uh Centro media and uh solid state so solid state they had sort of the responsibility for sort of the christian part of the scene and then Centro media had you know the rest uh, and what's happened and again I, it's understandable because the change of style was quite massive you know from from what we've done before so i i don't think any of the labels really uh, knew what to do w- with the album uh, and so they did nothing basically <laughs> so <laughs> wow so lack of promo there's like no little promotion nothing, for it, things like literally that literally nothing um and our oh man there's so many stories with that tour that's just insane and i could we could sit for the rest of you know the day but uh, it started out with, uh, we had hired a, a manager in the U.S. And like, I would say four months prior to, five months, maybe four or five months prior to the, to the tour. Um, and like three weeks before we were, you know, getting on a plane to the U.S., we didn't hear from him. Like literally nothing. Like radio yeah. silence. Uh. And, you know, even at that point, we should have just, okay, guys, uh this is not good we need to figure out what's going on here uh and we didn't hear from him uh until we sat on the plane uh and we went over and um yeah there was just no promotion for the record there were no promotion for the for the shows uh we had to uh yeah, no it was just a very very disappointing and, and quite challenging thing for us you know blueprint for us was sort of should have been what we wanted it to be was to be sort of like a step into the, you know, a little bit more into the mainstream, right? And then no, yeah. no one of our partners sort of understood that and and helped us get into those places where we could, you know, reach uh, a little bit broader. So we just ended up, you know, on, on yeah, the same places as we had done before, or you know, small shitty. <laughs> Yeah, no, literally, it was uh, it wasn't too fun. <laughs> oh my it God. probably speaks to like the how great that album is, though. Like with no promotion and no help, like that was an that's one of those albums that like everyone that was into Christian metal was familiar with and listened to. I think at some point or another, you know, it was oh, kind of like yeah. uh, when everything falls by haste of the day. Like everyone had a time with that record you know okay well oh, that's, so, that's great to hear because uh, our impression from the two two and a half months we were on the road on that album in the u.s was like okay nobody gives a shit uh this is you know uh a complete uh, failure right but I, i'm really glad to know that good. in the aftermath of this disaster that people actually you know <laughs> managed to to hear it and like it somehow i am sorry that i torrented it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I physically bought a copy. Don't worry. Yeah, you can. You can still. You can Sam still would. Buy Sam it. has integrity. You can still buy it, Casey. You can still buy it. There's all. Oh, okay. I, I will. I will do that. <laughs> Dude, what, who were so, you touring with on that tour? Uh, wasn't it Taste the Day? Oh. Okay. Uh, and uh, the sounds don't exactly align as well wow, as you might I'm, think. I guess my yeah. my my, um, my recollection is really really bad uh, from that tour. A long time ago. Yeah. You know, I that's one thing that like it's not just Christian metal, but Christian music in general was really bad about putting together tours 
that made any sort of sense. Yeah. Like it was like it was famous. Like anybody who was a youth group kid went to like 30 of those shows where it was like uh, one Christian rock band that you actually wanted to see a Christian rapper that you didn't like at all, <laughs> a Christian pop punk band that was all right. And then like one that was like, Oh, they're Christian rock, but really it's just worship music. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, and it was always just like chairs. Like nobody was standing up. It was just seating. Oh, yeah. Like they put together so many bad tours, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, C spot rock. To us, I don't think we had any bad experience with the people in the bands we toured with in the US. But uh, you know, stylistically, like the the the, the mix of, of of genres and everything was usually not a, uh, a very good combo. Uh, but again, yeah. I mean, it could have its benefits as well. I mean, you you get to promote your music to to a completely sort of different crowd than normally, so it could be good as well. But yeah. So, so in the aftermath of that, you, I mean the. There was, I mean, it was 2005, and then you guys kind of, did. You guys really slow down after that? Was that did, was it just a demoralizing experience? Which caught because I mean, it was what seven years between before you guys put out yeah. a new album. So, you took a, like a hiatus then, right? Yeah. So what happened was that uh, after uh, that disaster tour, we had one more tour in Europe with the uh, Opus, which was probably the best tour we've ever had. It was our second tour with Opus. Yeah. Um, we had one in 2003, and then this one. And I mean really 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 nice tour uh but then um i hit the wall like properly completely um i woke up one day with uh, just extreme ringing in my ears and um uh, anxiety from another dimension um and it just uh, really yeah wrecked me uh everything was just pitch black for a long 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 time um, and I remember, you know, I, I didn't really know what it was. Like, uh, I wasn't familiar with anxiety. I had no, nobody around me had ever talked about anxiety. <clears throat> and obviously this ringing in the ears when it becomes really crazy, you, you yeah, you, you get really scared. Uh, you think it's going to be like this forever. Um, so I told, to the, told the other guys that, hey, you know, playing death metal now with this in my ears. Uh, sorry, I can't do it. I'm, 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 I'm out. Uh, sorry, and which was obviously a big blow to the other guys, right? Um, because yeah, again, yeah. Uh, Blueprint era was you know it was supposed to be the time where we were stepping up and and taking everything, giving everything. Like especially me and David, the drummer, we were really um, yeah, we wanted to to this was our lives, right? Um, yeah, also wanted to try to make money off, off of it because we never earned any money before. So, but, but then, yeah, everything fell apart. My whole identity, like, since I was 14 years old, uh, I was the vocalist of, of Exol. And now, who the hell am I? Uh, so that started a, a completely new chapter in my life where uh, I, I sort of started questioning everything myself uh, my my faith my family my you know everything i knew it was like you know the the whole foundation for your life just crumbles and you you need to somehow uh figure a way to to build something again right um yeah so i went through some some pretty dark years but i i, I sort of just had to build myself up again um and um uh, in that period, I also started really the what do you, what do you say? Um, uh, Are you talking about in regards to your faith? Yeah, yeah. Like deconstructing. Uh, yeah, yeah, Is that yeah, the word you're looking for? Exactly. Yeah, deconstructing my faith. I, I, I like yeah. I was just starting questioning everything I, I knew, um, and uh, ended up in a very different place than I, yeah, had been before. Um, so when you. When you were, so when you were doing Extol, um, so I grew up, I mean, Casey and I both grew up from the time, basically from the time we were born, similar experience, just born into Christianity. Um, and there's this part of it that's just, it's always just, it's just who you are. You were just born into like, and we, we stuck to it. It was something that was important to us, but, um, you know, I had gotten into music a little bit, did a band thing for a little bit and, um, just in high school. And I remember feeling like this is, you don't want to overdo it, but you also, it is part of who you are and you want that to come out a little bit. 
uh, the people I did music with weren't Christians at all, uh, except for one. So like trying to like navigate that, was that, did you guys have like this, um, this missional mindset of, uh, of Christianity? Like we want to, we, we want to make the, basically your understanding at that time of the gospel known through your music, yeah. or is it just like something that came out and it wasn't a huge emphasis? No, it was definitely, uh, uh, we, we want people to, to see the love that we have experienced kind of thing. Uh, we were very, very strict about what extol was, how extol was supposed to be perceived, where, what we wanted to express. Um, uh, yeah, so extol was 100% completely about telling people about, you know, uh, the love uh, of, of Christ, basically. Okay. Um, so do you it's gotta that... be, it's gotta be tough, you know, when your, your whole life has been this, this art form, the art that you're putting out is completely centered around faith. And then like, you know, if you start to question your faith or you come to a point where you're like, I don't think this is for me anymore. You know, what do you do with the art that you've put out? I mean, I'm sure there's still like, so much of you that that's in there that you value and yet like how do you reconcile that with this message that you don't really believe anymore yeah it's been really tough for me and, and uh, i've been joking about this to my friends but i've called myself a music hater for the last 15 years uh, even while we did the the last Soul album it was not uh, a particularly fun and inspiring thing for me to do um doing the album was okay but we did also three live shows um after uh, that last record and uh, yeah i really regret it i regret doing those three al- um, the, the, those three um, concerts because it was a nightmare for me to stand there on stage and sort of be forced not be forced but i've chosen to step into this role again uh, into this extol box and standing on stage, I, I wasn't myself. Like, uh, I wasn't there anymore. Uh, and I couldn't sort of be, um, yeah, I, I couldn't be that vocalist of Extol that everybody was expecting or, or my bandmates were expecting. Or uh, Plus, I still were struggling w- with a lot of anxiety and a lot of, so yeah, it, w- it was a nightmare, actually. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like in the past couple of years here, especially, you know, we've seen quite a few artists from that genre, you know, like uh, Under Oath's the most, most, the biggest example, I think, where, uh, you know, they've, they've obviously like had a crazy life experience. They came to a point where they decided like, you know, not a Christian anymore in any way that anyone who is a Christian would recognize right. or, or acknowledge and um you know doing that publicly brought just tons of horrible scrutiny yeah. was was like your deconstruction was it a public thing did people know that you weren't really on the board with it anymore or no. you were kind of just holding it by yourself I'm not uh, consciously holding it by m- myself i mean talking to my friends and, and everybody wants to listen but i i've not been in, in any media right because i haven't been in releasing any music or, or anything like that for a long time so um yeah so, so and it was basically after the last extol record that most of i've started questioning a lot of things by by that time but i hadn't really uh i, ha- I hadn't really deconstructed that much so it was basically the years from then and up to now um uh, that most of the deconstruction has happened um and um yeah, but I mean, it's like, you know, when you have this set of beliefs, right? Uh, and then life happens and you have a picture of God, uh, you have a picture of Christianity, you have a picture of, um, of you know, life and the universe. And, and like you have this, yeah, you have this picture and then life happens and, and uh, your experience tells you that this picture cannot coexist with my real life experience. And then to me, I had to either uh, be false to myself and just, you know, lie to myself and, and tag along. 
and just you know don't really dare to to ask the questions or i had to ask the questions and be real with myself and and uh believe that if there is a god then then he will uh, or she or it will uh you know <laughs> be fine with me being true to myself um so i decided to to be true to myself and and dare to ask the questions and dare to uh to believe you know to to evolve to change um which i think is a it's a really important thing in life uh if you don't change if you believe the same thing as a 40 year old you know and uh when you were 15 or 20 it's it, i would say 99% of the time you're lying to yourself right that's my opinion yeah, that's such a good point yeah i totally agree with that i one of the things that i've i've often thought about is how like you know i i i don't think i don't remember the last time i went like if i you don't maybe recognize it happening at the time but if i look back you know every single year of my life i look back on something that i've changed my mind on yeah. or no longer think the same way about and i'm like when you look at people who have believed stagnantly the same thing for 40 years and this like there's just a structure and it works and everything fits and 40 years go by and you still think everything fits cleanly into these boxes that just i it feels to me like what you're saying is that if they're, they're not being at least true to themselves that they're not trying they don't it's easier to not ask the questions and i think uh, it sounds like people who have particular experience like you you know you had a certain life experience uh that kind of threw a wrench in the works i, th I think maybe most people just work their nine to five for 40 years and not a lot of life change happens and they can kind of just yeah, but I, I think what you see, and even with people in the music industry, especially you start out as Christian bands, like um, you're gonna have that faith evolution. You're bumping up with all these different people and seeing different people all the time, and and then with you and and the loss of all of that, you know, I'm sure that that I mean, it's hard to not change after after a catalyst like that. Yeah, but uh, but I also want to say that I mean, uh, I don't want to, you know tell people that they live their lives wrong that they haven't changed or that they should change or, or that's not my point but and i really believe mm -hmm. that people are different i mean my my personality type uh, is very different from for example uh, david the drummer in Exol, who who's um, a beautiful human being and and you know still um still believes a lot in the same way as he did before obviously not everything but uh, we don't really agree on on so much uh, when it comes to belief anymore, but I, I'm completely fine with that. Um, and you know, I, th I think that people should be just re you know respect each other's journeys. Uh, whether you're you're at the same place you were, or whether you've traveled along, or I mean, yeah, just respect that people have different opinions than you. People have different experiences with you uh, than you. Um, you know, one experience can change me in a very different way than uh, another guy. So, yeah. And I guess that's where I've landed yeah. uh, after these years of deconstruction. I, I, I've sort of landed in a place where I don't want to land. <laughs> uh, I don't want to, uh, 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 yeah. Seeing what I've seen and going through the experiences I have, uh, there are basically very few things that I want to say this is the truth. Um, and for that reason, I think many people don't, you know, would say that, no, you can't call yourself a Christian, um, which, uh, yeah, I think is a little bit sad, but it's not really important for me to, to, Hey, I'm a Christian or, or it's not a big deal for me, but, um, I, I would still say that I'm, <laughs> I'm within the, my beliefs are within the Christian tradition somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, people tell makes... Sam he's not a Christian all the time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think I find myself in a similar spot as you. Uh, the, the whole uh, you, you're not you're not really looking to change people's minds. Yeah. Uh, on what to believe so much. It sounds like you're more interested in the way, like it, it, that you're more interested in how people live their lives and what they say they believe in. Yeah, and the people are allowed to be true to themselves. You know, uh, there's nothing more. Uh, there's nothing I respect more than when people, you know, take some sort of choice, which really, you know, screws up their life because they need to be true to themselves. 
they know they can't continue in this path, but they know also that if I if I if I choose to sort of question things now or, or go in a different direction, it's going to be really really hard. But I have to do it because you know I, I have to be true to myself, and I really really respect that. Um, I really do. What uh, so did you do? You feel like you've gotten to a point where you can manage your anxiety and like how how did you learn to 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 cope with that yeah a good question uh an important question because there are so many people you know i've met after i started talking about my anxiety anxiety and being open about it um that you know they don't really yeah as it was with me in the beginning i didn't know what it was i wasn't familiar with it didn't know anyone like yeah so uh it wasn't until um yeah eight years after my anxiety started that i got some proper help um so me wow. me and my wife we went in um, we were lucky enough to, to get into this um it's actually like a mental uh, hospital of, of some sorts where they uh, take in families um uh, married couple and families uh with uh, you know that want to have a better <laughs> marriage basically um, and wow. it, this must be in Norway, it, right? It is in Norway. I don't think we have stuff like that. In the no, US. <laughs> I, I actually talked. About, You're on your own here. <laughs> I, I talked about this on the Bad Christian podcast like seven years ago or something, just after coming out of, the, of this um, uh, this uh, place, and they were like, "What? This is insane. We have never heard about a place like this." <laughs> but basically, you 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 you, uh, you apply. And if you get in, you will get your salary paid. You will get food. You will even get some some spare change to just you know whatever. And you have this beautiful, um, really charming old house all for yourself. And in this family uh, division or whatever you call it, there are ten houses like this. So you're there with ten other families at all time. Uh, and then you have um, uh, workouts uh, every day. Or, or at least two or three days a week with, uh, you know, uh, proper trainers. and But I also know a lot about, you know, men, mental um, health issues. Uh, you have couple therapy two or three times a week. You have courses about everything from emotions to, you know, whatever. And uh, they, there's their own school for the kids. There's their own kindergarten for the kids. And it's just out in the woods. You can walk this beautiful. I mean, it's just like, yeah, it's really, really. That's good. incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. So foreign and, to and, us. And, <laughs> and the government pay, pays for it, right? They pay for everything. Uh, so. Oh my God! If there's anything that exists, if anyone even tried Sanders. to, pro- yeah, right. <laughs> if, if anyone tried to even. Like just throw that out there in a uh, brainstorming session in uh, in our U.S. government, they would be laughed out of the room so yeah. fast. They would just be like, "That's clearly unsustainable," is what the government. Right. I to, mean, to I know be... there's a difference between the U.S. economy and the and Norway's, but that is still incredible to hear that that's that whole thing is set up just like for ten families. I mean, ten. If, fa- that's that's incredible. Yeah. To be fair, if you put American families in there, they'd probably steal all the copper pipes and no, set it on no, fire on no, their way no, out. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so so, I, I think that's yeah, that's where I you know properly got you know I got some real help. Obviously, that place is mainly to to not um, it's mainly for the couples to work on on the couples issues, but obviously it, it helps a lot on the individual. Um, Part of it as well, um, and then we were there for uh, ten weeks. We lived there for ten weeks, and then uh, when I came, we were, we came back home. Um, I went to this cognitive therapy thing for like five five weeks, and after that, my life has been completely changed. Wow! So the I mean, so what people anyone in the U.S. struggling with anxiety needs to move to Norway, move to Norway, yeah. and uh, <laughs> change their citizenship. No. Okay, we get no, it. No, no, no. See a <laughs> professional, right? See a professional. I mean, yeah. uh, there are so many possibilities. Uh, I hear podcasts from the US now. You have this, uh, what's it called? Where you can uh, book um, online um, uh, online uh, therapy. Yeah, online There's therapy. Better, like help. better help. Better help, yeah. right. Better help. Uh, and I mean, or, or yeah, you, you obviously have some, some people you can go to. So seek help. I mean, anxiety is, is nothing, um, it's not dangerous. It's not. Uh, it's very unpleasant, 
but it's it's usually not dangerous uh, or you know uh, it's it's possible to get help. Um, so talk to people about it. See if you can find a therapist that you know you you get some good chemistry with and uh, get some help. Yeah. Well, so was the um, trying to get the timeline right? Was it after you came out of that program that you did those three shows that you just wished you didn't do? No. Was that or is that during? The shows before. were before that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's a, that. I mean, that's cool. I, I, that's an interesting story, man. It's even just hearing it, I, like I, you can still see the smile on our faces while you were telling it. It's just, yeah. it seems like it's actually hard for us to believe that uh, institutions like that uh, exist. So, did you, um, you know, so you're doing this with your your wife. It's mostly dedi- like dedicated towards the couples. Obviously, there wouldn't be a faith element to it. Was there any issue? Like, did you and your ever experienced issues with um a changing of your faith and and having did you was that related to your anxiety at all or do you think it just happened around the same time i know i hear a lot of people like a big part of the conversation in the u.s with people who are leaving religion or changing their mind about it it's there's aspects of it that's so deeply ingrained in them that it does trigger anxiety for a lot of people when they're when they're starting to process that do you was that the case for you at all I don't know. I'm not really sure. I mean, was it yeah. my 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 uh, you know questioning of my faith uh, that was triggering it? Was it um, my the ringing in my ears that triggered it? Was it the the anxiety that that triggered my ringing in, in the ears? I mean, I who knows? Who knows? Yeah. One thing I do know is that my my um, my uh, baggage, my 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 family history. Uh, it's probably one of the things that has triggered this whole thing a lot. Um, where I had, yeah, I had a, fa- a father who sort of disappeared when I was 10, 11, just after our second time in East Africa. And he wasn't there until, oh, really? yeah, until many, many, many years later. Um, uh, yeah, I, I know, yeah, I'm not going to go into those details here, but. Okay. I think some of this family, like what you experience as a child and an early youth, it sort of uh, sets you up for uh, when you get married. So when when you finally get married and sort of establish this uh, this thing uh, that you're supposed to somehow be in control of, uh, whatever you have with you up to then, it's really gonna affect how you can cope with. Uh, uh, you know, being a father or a wife or a husband, wife, mother. Um, and I had some proper issues there that I needed to, to work on. Um, so I think that that was probably a big part of it as well. Hmm. So you went, you, you, for a spell, you considered yourself a music hater. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you kind of rekindled your, your love of music throughout that whole process though. Finally, I, I mean, I, I'm not joking with you. I, I, it was so hard for me to listen to music for almost 15 years. Like, I have so many friends playing in bands, releasing music. And it could be my sort of my best friend uh, on a release party for the new album. And I, I'm dead serious now. I, I would listen to two songs and I would just leave the room because it, it got so complicated to me. Uh, and I didn't really understand wow. why. I thought it was, you know, yeah, I, I don't know, whatever. But the last couple of years, I've sort of tried to <laughs> analyze this. Um, and I think the problem was that, as I mentioned earlier uh, in this interview, uh, I started um, leading worship when I was 14 years old. And I was leading worship like sometimes once a week, sometimes four times a week. Uh, in church and then yeah we started our own church after a while uh, this is sort of like a more like a yeah we we're metalheads and, and rock uh, hip-hop people artists like more of a subcultural church that i was a part of starting uh, so, so i mean and then also extol being on the stage with extol at some point down the line i suddenly saw myself from sort of the outside and i started question like uh peter what, what are you doing here like why why are you doing this like this is just fake this is autopilot and this is fake 
And so what I think uh, happened to me, like when I stopped playing myself and then started to see, you know, listen to other bands or whatever, I, I, I sort of projected myself into like when seeing them. So I would look at, at, at the band or an artist on stage and I was like, yeah, you're a fake, right? Which wasn't hmm. fair. It's not fair <laughs> because maybe they were not fake or maybe they yeah. were, I don't know. But I was sort of just pr- projecting myself uh, and it made everything just very complicated. But then uh, one and a half years ago, <laughs> I had a very funny experience because I was turning 40 and I was having this, yeah, <laughs> very nice party at my home with um, some of my closest friends. And me and um, the guy that I'm doing music with now called Osman, we we uh, decided to sing a song in my birthday party. And we sung the song um, Old Friends by Simon and Garfunkel, which is a really beautiful song. Uh, and for the first time in so many years, I had a, just a beautiful, really, really heartfelt, inspiring, beautiful moment with music. Uh, hmm. And after that, just little by little, I felt this creative flow coming back from really deep inside of me. Uh, and then after like, yeah, half a year, or eight months or something, uh, uh, we just decided, okay, it's time to make music again. And, and obviously, I wanted to make music with him because he's, he's a yeah, he's my best friend and he does music as well. And so we just decided, okay, let's do a let's do a project together. So that's what we're doing now. But yeah, it's been a long time. I mean, I, I, seriously, I never thought, I, I really thought that I would never do music again in my life. I was 100% sure because I was so fed up with it and I just felt, yeah, I'm done with that thing. Uh, it's not, it, yeah. Was that the first time you sang in 15 years? Were you wondering if you still had? <laughs> well, except for these like, soul shows that I had in between there that I really regretted. Yeah, I think it was. Wow. Music is weird in that way, like when you've done the uh the band thing and stuff you know like i know for me and and mine was just local nonsense in college but uh you know there was a three-year period there where one i think i i finally started to establish my own personality yeah you know independent of all of my old friends and all of the places that I had been, you know, I'd grown up in such a small sheltered community. Like that was my time to step out and to start doing things on my own. And a a huge part of my identity through that period was playing in a band. And, you know, everybody, I think everybody who plays in a band has got like these uh, delusions of grandeur, you know, or just dreams of, of doing it professionally and being on a big stage and stuff. And, for most people, that doesn't happen, and it's hard to reconcile with that after it's done. You know, it's not that like by the time it was done, I mean, I was ready to move on from that, but it was still like that's who I was, that's who I projected myself as to everyone around me. Right, and it took a long time to sort of uh, to stop that. Mm-hmm. You know, like. You are not the clothes you wear. You're not the music that you listen to. And like, if that's the most interesting thing about you as a person, you're, you know, that's pretty shallow. And, but it's, it's hard. I feel like maybe that's like a thing that most teenagers go through, but I did it as like a 24 year old. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, when I look back to, to sort of my, from when I was like 18 to 25 or yeah, basically to the, this uh, hiatus uh, started um, back in 2007. Uh, I look back and I'm 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 sort of ashamed uh, to my you know closest friends that didn't do music because it was the only thing I was talking about. You know, it was the only thing I was thinking about. It was, it was like, hey, hey, you want to listen to a new song? Hey, you want to you know? Um, and sometimes. I mean, even, even though we weren't really a huge band, you know, you, you get high on yourself. And, and and we had the focus of trying to to get our, you know, bring each other back down on the ground. And, and I don't think we were the worst band in that sense. But uh, but still, I mean, yeah, being put in the in the in the spotlight uh, like you do playing in a band and, and you're at that age. It's, it's yeah, it's hard to cope with, man. It's it's. Uh, <laughs> It's not easy to to keep your feet on the ground and and not be sort of swallowed up by 
by uh, you know the um, recognition and, and you always want people to say good things about you and your music and you want to be yeah. so it's, it's, it's tough <laughs> don't start new bands yeah. kids I wonder if, yeah, keep, keeping your ego in check at that age is uh, <laughs> definitely not entirely easy uh, yeah. that's when it's probably at its worst <laughs> yeah <laughs> So your new project, though, I mean, this that's got to be kind of exciting because, I mean, you're coming into it as a as a whole different person that's a lot more grounded, that yeah. knows themselves. And like, that's got to reflect in the art that you put out. For sure. I mean, both in the music and, and but also in the lyrics and, and, you know, the way we approach things, it's a very different feeling. Um, obviously, also a different feeling because now I'm doing music completely without anyone I've done music with before which is really refreshing i love the exo guys uh, they are my best of friends still and um, but yeah it's, it's really really refreshing to do something completely new and uh, me and osman we have this we decided straight away we have one rule in this project and that's uh, everything is allowed like if it feels good no matter what kind of genre like if it feels good we're gonna do it uh so it's that's so inspiring you don't have to you know feel confined to this box that's supposed to um express something or some way or, or whatever like we can do whatever we want to and <laughs> no nobody has any expectations uh so it's just yeah really beautiful uh experience so far um and so you're writing a black metal album yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> A really boring black metal album. That's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, is there a? I know you said you've got you've got a single coming out soon. Yep, uh, our first single. It's called Gospel Oak. Uh, it was actually um, <laughs> uh, based. I, I was sitting at home, uh, just getting more and more frustrated about the Donald Trump and the whole, uh, you know, everything. Especially late, like when it when it gets got closer to the elections and everything. I'm not going to go into politics, but um, and I started to to research uh, the U.S. history when it comes to the connection between um, uh, evangelicals and the right wing uh, extreme. Yeah, like everything from from you know Ku Klux Klan to to you know how things are looking today. Uh, and it was just really depressing uh, material to read because uh, it looks like the church um, in a big way has uh, sort of um, accepted and, and not even just accepted, but being a, a force into um, yeah uh, this whole racism thing that you see in the U.S. still today. Um, so I, I did some proper research on that and, and then just this Gospel Oak song came came around uh, from that uh, so basically it's about you know racism and, and abuse of power within the the religious uh, uh, sphere um, yeah so <laughs> really uplifting song <laughs> um, so it's gonna be out uh, it's very timely uh, that sounds I'm interested in that I can't wait to hear it yeah. sorry when, it's gonna be out when it's gonna be out uh, um, end of May beginning of June somewhere around there um we're releasing it uh, by ourselves in in uh, most of the world but then we have uh, partnered up with someone called Mystic Panda in the US which is uh some friends of ours uh they actually run a, um a film studio uh but they also uh, want to start um distributing or being more like a sales agent for for bands so um, the reason we ended up with them is that they are really uh they want sort of to yeah they have the same passion for art and creativity as we have um so that's sort of what was important for us um rada is the name of our new project rada um it's a, well, you um, might have to spell that one yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a r a d a h r a d a it's an Rana. old, gotcha. It's there an old go. Norwegian word. We don't use it anymore in Norway, but um, it means to create. So the whole thing about creativity is really important in in Rada. Uh, we're gonna put out music, but that's we're not gonna limit ourselves to that. We're gonna put out uh, 
different forms of art, whether it's, you know, awesome artwork or music videos or podcasts or, you know, it's sort of going to be, be this package that we want to just, um, just a flow of creativity. Uh, and again, with the with this one rule, everything is allowed as long as it's you know we like it. <laughs> I think that's cool. And that's there's awesome. like I feel like there's going to be kind of a swell of that sort of uh, creative path yeah. coming. Yeah. Like we talked to uh, Jesse Leach from Kill Switch Engage yeah. a couple months ago, mm-hmm. and you know he has a solo project. Oh, God. Sam, what is it? You sprung that on me a little uh, by surprise, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, his solo project, they're, they're kind of like s- talking in the same way about where that's headed, you know, about, uh, you know, visual artwork that comes along with it and video and some of that kind of stuff. And I think that'll be that'll be cool to see. And it's a, it'll be kind of a welcome break from the standard like, oh, uh, here's a single, here's a music video. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's that sort of thing. And I mean, yeah, to us, yeah. it's really natural. Osman, he's been working with the film uh, and TV production for yeah many, many years. So he's really a visual guy as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think the music industry, you know how it is. It, it, you're sort of forced to, uh, I think you're forced to do something to, to get some attention as well uh something else than just making music because everybody makes music and it's just spewed out there you know on spotify or whatever and yeah so we just want to do this package where we just do whatever we want to and have fun and uh we'll see where where it where it ends up or yeah we hope we can you know also try to make music for some tv series or you know films and stuff like that our our music is quite dramatic um it's got a lot of strings and uh you know quite big big sound organic sound not metal at all thank god um (laughs) (laughs) metal sucks man (laughs) (laughs) norway has like just like a must have a thriving music scene because my wife and i have like this joke where we're like we'll hear a band and we're like, this is cool. I wonder where it's from. And it's always Norway. It seems like. (laughs) Yeah. Leprous and some of those types of groups. Yeah. No, there are many good bands from Norway, but I I think there are many good bands from from other places as well. So, but yeah, I mean, in Norway we have. Not Kansas. (laughs) (laughs) We we have this, uh, again, uh, as it was with this uh, mental institution, we, we also have some, you know, uh, money for artists and musicians from the government so that you know people actually can survive creating music so maybe maybe in a in a little bit better way than the us uh at least some some musicians are able to to actually do what they really want to and then that usually becomes good instead of trying to make money and, and you know make music that appeals to everyone to try to make money if you understand what i mean yeah wow like That's here really to survive, musicians have to like start an OnlyFans and take shirtless <laughs> pictures or yeah. something like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it seems like they all have to. You're just trying to sling. Well, you, you used to just try to sling CDs everywhere you could. Now people don't even buy physical copies of music anymore. I can't even imagine what it, you have to do to survive as a band now yeah. when you're just getting started. It sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, it's a nightmare. I mean, what do you have to stream like? 10 million on Spotify to even make a decent month sal- salary or something. I don't know. It's, it's just crazy. So, yeah. Well, I'm, we're really excited for what you got coming out. I can't wait to, uh, we'll link, like Casey said, we'll link to it. We'll, uh, we'll put it out there when this episode comes out, it'll probably come out around that time. So it should coincide with the release of your awesome. single. And awesome. And before we, uh, before we close down here, I got, I have a question for you. That's fair, fairly serious. Um, You've spent a lot of time in the U.S. What's your favorite place in the U.S. and what's your absolute least favorite place that you've been to? Oh, that's hard. Uh, uh, so many. I mean, we, we've least favorite. We've literally like we flew into Chicago, drove all the way to New York, all the way down to Florida, all the way down south to California, all the way up to Seattle, and then back to Chicago. So I mean, we've been like everywhere. So it's a little bit hard for me to remember all the places, but um, 
I, I like California because of the the sun and the nice, you know, it's a good vibe there. Uh, I like Seattle because it, it reminded me of Norway. Um, but some of the most exciting places were those, you know, <laughs> like in in the middle of nowhere, south in you know wherever Alabama or South Texas or like you, you just felt you were in a David Lynch movie or, or some crazy, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. It, it's just uh, you know for us, I, I remember that very clearly the first time in '98 when when we came into the U.S. and started driving around, we rented some cars and we're driving ourselves and. It felt like we had seen everything before because we had seen it in movies and TV series. So, like, you know, nothing was really new, but it was so exciting to sort of be inside the movie, <laughs> if you understand what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very strange yeah. feeling, you know. It, it, yeah, things are so big, it's so huge, everything is just so, um, yeah. So, it, it was uh, very, <laughs> very exciting for us as, as uh, kids to come down there and, and just yeah experience the United States of America. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't yeah. really answer your question, but um, it, it's been such a long time, so I don't really... Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll just help you out and we can say that Massachusetts is the worst. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, Kansas was probably the worst because it was it, that was a really... I think we played there only once, and it was just in Kansas City. It felt like a ghost ghost town somehow. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it was just uh, the, the day. I think there was this thunderstorm or something, and it was just a uh, very weird atmosphere in the whole place. <laughs> I don't know if there's much of a music scene up there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well... Peter, thanks so much oh, for sorry. joining sorry. us. I sharing some yeah, Gr- yeah. Grable, Wyoming. Yeah, that's the place. Grable, <laughs> Wyoming, huh? Search the worst. Search Google it now. Google it now. That's the place to be. <laughs> we had one show there, and it was so epic. Oh yeah, so is this this goes on the list of one of the best places. Yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> We, we we were driving up north. Oh, uh, we we're driving up north. Can you see how many people living in Grable, uh, Casey? Oh uh, yeah. Well, uh, let's see. <laughs> it looks like it's basically an intersection, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been there. That's that's nowhere as nowhere gets. <laughs> right. There. So we we were driving uh, up north, and you know, just okay. Well, we, we're getting close. I mean, we can't see any high buildings. We can't see any city approaching. Like, where is this place? And then suddenly, you know, we see this sign, welcome to Grable, Wyoming. Uh, and it was like, I don't remember, like 1,264 people live here. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> but it was really... 2019, it had a population of 1,981. Right. Yeah, exactly. So... <laughs> <laughs> But it was so fun because it felt like everybody in in this place was there. It was just like you know the grandmas and the grandpas, and just everybody had a good time. And yeah, it was, it was a nice feeling. It's like a little uh, enclave of death metal fans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Peter's been great having you, man. It's good to meet you, uh, and uh, thanks for sparing some time. Really excited for your new music project. And, yes. Sir. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hopefully, we'll talk to you again in the future. Thank you so much for having me. It's been yeah, it was a pleasure talking to you guys. I love your I love your pro- podcast. Yeah, I, I got to spend some time in the last couple of weeks to listen to the episodes, and uh, yeah, good, uh, good, good pod- oh, podcast. Nice. I like it. Keep it up. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate you checking it out. Yeah. Yep. Thanks everybody for listening, and we will talk to you next time.